Okay, we're going to talk in this lecture about uh, adaptations of the lung to two different situations. Uh, one is to high altitude and the other is to cigarette smoke. Um, high altitude questions are very high yield. Okay, so this is a reminder. I said this a couple times, but what is actually decreasing at high altitude is the atmospheric pressure. Um, you know, at sea level, it's around 760, and then as you move up higher, that number decreases. So if that number decreases, um, the PiO2 decreases, therefore the P alveolar O2 decreases. Uh, remember, this 21% this oxygen actually, I believe, is maintained no matter how high you go above sea level. Uh, this slides I borrowed from Tom Curtis. I actually got permission from Tom Curtis and Eric Harp, uh, who's a pathology professor, to borrow a couple of their slides. So I want to give them credit and thank them for letting me do so. Uh, both the Curtises are really good at animation, so you know, I borrowed these animations from him. So this is what's happening at sea level, you know, right now. Uh, alveolar oxygen is around 100, um, or 100 to 105. Um, the PaO2 of the pulmonary arterial blood is coming in, and remember that's deoxygenated deoxy blood. Um, and we have diffusion of the oxygen as we go along the length of the pulmonary capillary. The equilibrium is reached, and the PaO2 is uh, around 100, P small AO2. Now at high altitude, remember the P big AO2 is decreased, let's say to 80 in this case. And what's going to happen is the same thing happens, but equilibrium is reached because uh, gas exchange isn't impaired, right? That's not the thing that's wrong. And the P small, small AO2 will be around the same. And this is a good example of why there's a normal AA gradient at high altitude. Um, because, you know, both P big A and P small A O2 are decreasing. So what's happening on, or what's go happening on, what's going on in the short term? Uh, so the first adaptation to decrease oxygen is mediated by, this is, important. We talked about this Monday a little bit. Peripheral chemoreceptors. Okay. And they're going to sense the decreased oxygen availability and as a compensatory mechanism calls increased respiratory rate hyperventilation. Now what that causes is a byproduct. You know, it does help take in more oxygen, but as a byproduct you're blowing off more CO2. And what that does is decrease the arterial CO2, uh, and that causes a temporary respiratory alkalosis, a decrease in this P small a CO2 causes an increase in the pH. Uh, another short-term response is increased heart rate, and this helps to relieve the perfusion limitation. Uh, increased heart rate means in, more increased blood flow, uh, not only to the system, but to the lungs, right? Um, so I'm definitely going to ask some test questions on short-term adaptations and long-term adaptations. Okay, now longer-term responses. First thing, hopefully you know this uh, from renal, but in response to the respiratory alkalosis, uh, the kidney within 24 to 48 hours will respond by increasing the excretion of bicarb. Um, so you're peeing more bicarb out. Um, so you're losing a basic compound. Um, so what you're doing is you're acidifying the blood, right? So you're getting rid of bicarb. Uh, you're going to help to bring bring that pH 
lower the pH back to normal. Okay, so remember this is a response to the respiratory alkalosis. The kidney's response to alkalosis is to increase the excretion of bicarb. Yeah. <laughs> God, no, I'm second guessing it. I think I said that right. Just tell me in class if I'm wrong or email me. <laughs> and do that if I mess up on any of this stuff. If it's like an obvious mistake, please let me know. Um, and that causes uh, decreased bicarb in the CSF. And that's, oh man, that's important for some reason. Something with cerebral edema in the brain. I don't know, again, kind of off track here. Okay, but second, second long-term response is increased red blood cell um, concentration. And what is the mechanism of that? Hopefully you guys know that. EPO, remember there's increase, the kidney is signaled to uh, increase EPO, increase gene expression of EPO, which goes to the bone marrow and increases red blood cell um, production. And that increases the carrying capacity. Uh, as a third, and probably like from what I've seen, one of the most high yield things at high altitude, increase 2, 3 DPG. Uh, and that, as you know, hopefully, will increase or will cause a right shift of that hemoglobin dissociation curve, uh, which helps unload oxygen from the hemoglobin into the tissues more efficiently. Uh, this is a good summary table from BRS. You know, should, this is like really, really, really good to look at. Put a smiley face there. Not just for this class, but like for boards, definitely. Oh, remember I talked about hypoxic vasoconstriction? So that's another, um, that's another response to the low oxygen, right, in the lungs. Okay, now, cigarette smoke. And I could have, like, went a million directions with this. Like, you will learn the effects of cigarette smoke in every single organ. Um, and it, this... The slide, I think it's only one slide, it doesn't nearly cover everything that goes on in the remodeling of the lungs from cigarette smoke because there's it does a lot of stuff, but I want to highlight you know some of the most important. Okay, so the first thing that's really important is it causes a process called metaplasia. And uh, so normally, answer this on your own, what is um, you know the respiratory epithelium? Um, and ma you know, let's do mainly in the in the large airways, like the conducting zone. Give you a minute to answer that on your own. Um, okay, so it's pseudo stratified, ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Um, and what happens is uh, when there's chronic irritation, that could be from anything theoretically, but in this case, it's in the form of cigarette smoke. Chronic irritation, chronic irritation just bombards this epithelium and it undergoes a change, uh, which is where the term metaplasia comes from. It's a change in the type of epithelium uh, to stratified squamous. And squamous epithelium is very good with dealing with harsh insults. Uh, so that's why specifically stratified squamous is good at dealing with harsh insults to the epithelium. Uh, another really important thing, we have goblet cell hypertrophy. Uh, and I should get, never mind, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, but goblet cell hypertrophy and goblet cells uh, secrete, you know, mucus and lubricants and like all this stuff 
Um, and so they will increase in size in response to the uh, smoke irritation. And you also see mucus hypersecretion. Uh, and you know this right here, this is the mechanism of uh, chronic bronchitis. You have these mucus plugs that block up the airways. Um, you can get cyanotic you know, or hypoxemic. Um, not good. Uh, let's go back to this first one. So the, the reason this is so bad is something called like the carcinoma sequence. So the first thing that happens is metaplasia, but then that can lead to dysplasia, which is like disordered growth. The, the cells kind of start to go a little bit rogue. Um, and that can lead to dysplasia in C2, which is like in place. Um, but that can lead to carcinoma in C2. And at this time, we have a cancer, okay? Um, and then eventually that can lead to metastatic. Um, so that's why that is bad. Whoops. Oh, that's annoying. Um, yeah, another thing that is very important, smoke is a huge chemotactic uh, molecule. And chemotactic means there's going to be all kinds of recruitment of immune cells. Um, and there's going to be production of cytokines by those immune cells that recruit even more immune cells. So you have like the worst kind of positive feedback mechanism going on. Um, neutrophils, macrophages come in, uh, and in some cases eosinophils, and they accumulate in the respiratory unit, which is not good, right, uh, and release free radicals and elastases. Uh, and as you can imagine, there's damage to DNA that happens. Um, and what you eventually get is um, from these, you get a a buzzword is like a pro oh my gosh dude stop that protease anti protease imbalance dude <laughs> you get a protease anti protease imbalance and so what that means is these antiproteases, um, an example of which is alpha-1 anti, alpha antitrypsin, uh, normally can keep these proteases and elastases in check. Um, but smoking causes like kind of an acquired alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and deficiency of other antiproteases. So now this in, this imbalance is caused where these proteases are increased, antiproteases decreased, and the proteases and elastases kind of go wild chewing everything up. Um, that's not supposed to be chewed up. In addition, we're having an increase in free radicals and a simultaneous decrease in antioxidants that usually deal with the free radicals. So the free radicals can just go rogue and destroy a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, antioxidant examples would be like glutathione, um, yeah, there's like several other important ones, but I can't think of any right now. Uh, and so this is just a summation of the most common things caused from cigarette smoke. Uh, laryngeal cancer, remember the larynx is actually part of the conducting zone, right? It's at the back of your throat. Uh, and smoking is actually the most common cause of laryngeal cancer. As you can imagine, it's the most common cause of lung cancer. Um, COPD. And COPD kind of encompasses both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Um, so that is hopefully a decent summation of uh, cigarette smoke. I believe the only thing we have left after this is acid-base.